Eight. Wow. This is an amazing room full of people who are all already changing the world. So it's incredibly exciting. Great to see you all. Um, I want to thank Jen and Jen Brown and Amelia Curran and Barbara, of course, from Power to Transform. Um, when you asked me to speak, I was thinking about calling this speech Wither the Female Gaze. But then I thought, being in Germany, it would be Wither the Female Gaze. It's already confusing. The gaze, the male gaze, the female gaze. When you talk about the male gaze, people think you're talking about the G-A-Y-S. And in particular, male gays, G-A-Y-S, are furious if they find out they're not the topic of conversation. <laughs> so be very careful when you mention the male gays around them. <laughs> Tread lightly. Um, so around 1975, about 50 years ago, Laura Mulvey coined the words the male gays and the female gays. Um, and since then, everybody's really been wondering about whether or not a camera can have a gender. Can a camera have a penis? Can a camera be a penis? Good timing. <laughs> can a camera be a penis? Can a camera be a vagina? These are questions for another speech. When I came out as non-binary a few years ago, I realized that I was no longer female, nor male for that matter, and so neither of these gazes could I any longer claim. A few years ago, I coined the phrase the trans trickster gaze. I was talking about framing Agnes at Sundance. The camera's trans. It takes wild left turns out of nowhere. As does the logic. People have said that about my work. They've said vigorous beat changes. You never know what's going to happen. Trans gaze, the trans trickster gaze. I don't know. It's not, it's not that great. A, it's exclusionary. Only I and other trans people get to be the tricksters. No women, so that's not good. Um, so I am going to submit a new name for our collective gaze. It's just... It's coming out here in Berlin. I'm gonna call it, it's not a great name. I just wanna <laughs> prepare you by saying, I don't love this, but it's all we have right now. I'm gonna call it the other gaze. <laughs> the other gaze. Again, not great. Not great for a revolution, but they're words. And as you said, the words that you read are keys. And in a room like this, I wanna share with you some words that I read. It was about 15 years ago. I was standing in a bookstore at the magazine rack, which is just amazing. We should just stop there. That I went to a bookstore, that there was a magazine rack, that there were magazines. And I remember exactly where I was. I was in Los Angeles in Silver Lake at the Circus of Books bookstore on the corner of Sunset and Hyperion. And I opened a magazine, and I think it was American Filmmaker. And it was about a woman who had just left the public relations business, and she had scraped together enough money for her first feature. The film was called The Middle of Nowhere, and her name was Ava DuVernay. And in this article, she said, filmmaking is a tool to wrest control of the power structure. The reason I know that is because I went back and Googled it. <laughs> but I remember reading that article, and she also said, I'm just gonna say that again, because it's so meaningful. Filmmaking is a tool to wrest control of the power structure, and she said that for women and for people of color, protagonism is propaganda for our privilege. She said pr protagonism is propaganda for our privilege, and our weapon is our art. And that, that was 15 years ago, that changed me. I kept going, is, is protagonism propaganda or is, is privilege, I, it, it all made sense that these movies, these main characters, these actors, these directors, these writers were all reinstating their own privilege, reinstating white supremacy, reinstating male privilege, reinstating misogyny by simply holding on to the gaze, by having the gaze. 
Ava is more than just a filmmaker. She's an activist. She's a thought leader. She, the way she put words together changed me and created this spark for me that brings me here. She named the water. She named the air around us. She named the fact that at this point, let's just say it, the male gaze is its opportunity hoarding. It's opportunity hoarding. It's white men hoarding opportunities for themselves and people like them. That's what the male gaze is. And you know, as my mom would say, very simply, she would just say, enough already. <laughs> it's like a, a Jewish woman from Chicago. Enough already. What do I have to say about the male gaze? Enough already. Enough already. Enough already. <laughs> enough already. Who, <laughs> like me, are worried that there are many great actors who have not yet gotten the opportunity to wear certain period glasses in certain period films. A lot of actors need to play guys in the 70s. They are so interested in The Godfather, they're making a documentary. Men need roles, they need costumes, they need glasses. I know I don't want to like, I don't need a head start from these men who are making movies about the male gaze, but I guess I just wish that occasionally some of them would realize that those of us who were not assigned male at birth, those of us who were not assigned white at birth in patriarchy and white supremacy, we don't have the access to the spoils of white supremacy and patriarchy. We're competing with these guys. The, the male gaze is a reification of their protagonism. I'm competing with them. I was assigned female at birth. I have no access to patriarchal privilege unless I want to put on a dress and walk on a red carpet and be a doll. It's true. And if these men who are so thrilled to be continuing their artistic dreams won't recognize that they're actually perpetuating patriarchy with their protagonism of the male gaze, what's even worse than the male gaze is something that philosopher Lily Loofborough calls the male glance. The male glance is the response to women's cultural work that says, mm, nothing to see here. No, nope, nothing to see here. Loofborough says that the male glance is so insidious because it is quicker and more careless than the male gaze. It looks, it assumes, and it moves on. Lily Loofborough calls the male glancer closer to the amateur astronomer than to an actual explorer. Rather than investigate or discover or see, they point and classify, point and classify. And if any of you have ever been on a date with a cis man, they do a lot of pointing. <laughs> I call these teaching dates, be careful. If you are out at night, they will put one hand on the small of your back and they will start to point to the Big Dipper. <laughs> a few things, whether you wanted them to teach you or not. So beware of cis men, especially those that are realizing that they're, they will start to teach you about, about astronomy. Um, so here we are, February 16th, let's, Wikipedia, I hope, I hope you're listening, the other gays, was started here, and again, it's not a great name. It's, 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 it's a point of view. Actually, it's not a point of view, no. It's a prism. The other gaze is a prism of feeling seeing by anyone who is other. Other, it sounds better than cutie pock. We say cutie pock in uh, LA, we say cutie pock. People say, could you get me a cutie pock editor? Could we make sure we have some cutie pock people on this project? It stands for queer or trans people of color. Queer or trans or people of color, cutie pock. Um, the problem was actually though that when what older white men heard it, they got very excited and they're like, I want one of those cutie pocks. <laughs> Somebody bring me a cutie pock. I think they thought it was like an ice cream bar. <laughs> I need a cutie pock, I want two cutie pocks. And then an assistant was like, I'm so sorry to bother you. Cutie Pock is actually a queer or trans person of color. Um, oh, I still like one. I'd like, well, I'd like one or two. I'd like one or two Cutie Pocks. But first, let me hire a few hundred more white men to investigate this Cutie Pock situation. We're going to have a panel on Cutie Pocks. 
but I do know I want one of these cutie pox. They sound delicious. Oh, Hollywood. During Me Too and Time's Up, we learned that our studios and our streamers, the people we are begging for money, had so much more money to spend and had already spent so much money paying women to shut up about their stories. They spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars asking women and people of color to put tape over their mouth when we, as assigned female at birth people, begged to be paid for our stories. They preferred to pay for us to hide our stories. They have paid us to lie. They don't want to pay us for our stories. That's what's happening in Hollywood right now. And if we do have any kind of like feminist, I would love to do this study to force every studio and streamer to say, this is what we've spent on settlements for NDAs. This is what we paid out to keep people quiet. This is what we paid female screenwriters. I'm, just, I'm curious. I can't help it, guys. It's hard being an activist and trying to like pull down a bridge as I'm trying to climb up it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to make it and, and have the kind of career that the men in my, in my age, age range have, but I'm also an activist. So I'm, I'm literally pulling down the bridge as I'm trying to climb up it, which is very trans, so that's good. Um, so we're gonna claim the male, to combat the male gaze and to combat the male glance, we are gonna name the other gaze. Um, not the other gays, G-A-Y-S, although I am looking for them, if anybody knows where they hang out in Berlin. Um, the non-binary gays, the other gays, the other, this time I am talking about the G-A-Y-S, um, and those would be the trans ones I'm looking for. Um, so if you do know where they're hanging out, please do drop a pin later tonight. Um, and as I wrap up and I think about a call to action, I wanna ask cis men, yes, you holding your camera, looking at photographs of me. You gazer, you male gazer, you. <laughs> I wanna ask you something. I wanna ask you, are you willing to see that you are the problem? You are the problem, why? Because we're living in this world of the male gaze and men get a lot of shade standing under the clouds that are the male gaze. You, it's like your sunscreen. I don't have an end, but I have an almost end. But we are here to say those aren't clouds, they're smog, and we're dying. I'm just telling him, he's not listening. The men who are continuing to opportunity hoard the male gaze and calling it their artistic right to tell their stories, I'm just gonna say that the other gaze demands that if you're not using your story to take apart white supremacy and patriarchy, and in fact, reifying it, if you're not using your money, your tools, your studio, your script to take apart your privilege to rebuke white supremacy and patriarchy, you don't get to call yourself an artist. You are not a revolutionary. You are not fighting fascism. You must stand against white supremacy and patriarchy. And men, if you wanna make stuff, find ways to, to center others. You don't even have to tell people you're doing it. I'm centering others. No, don't do that. The last thing I want to say, because I don't really... Oh, this is, this, is what, this, is, this is my last joke. But then I just want to talk about the binary afterwards. When we say to the men that, you, you know, you're standing under the clouds. You are standing under the clouds of the male gaze that are, are providing cis men with shade. For us, those clouds are smog. We are dying. And when you say that to a man, most of the time he will say something to the effect of, I have no idea what you're talking about. Will you listen to my podcast? <laughs> Careful, trying to bring this stuff up outside of this room. Barbara, be careful. They won't hear it, they can't hear it. But the last thing I wanna do is talk about being a trans person and a non-binary person at a, at, a film, at a festival where the binary keeps coming up. I keep he hearing people say it, like women are like this, men are like this, women shoot like this, men shoot like this. There are so many people between the binary. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk, uh, last about Olivia Lang, who's an amazing writer and who wrote that actually fascism needs the binary. 
that, that the binary is the soil that allows fascism to take root, the creation of the other. So the last thing I wanna say about creating the other gays, we got this, Barbara, don't look sad, we're gonna do it, we're here. We're gonna remember that my words affected you and Ava's words affected me and who knows when or where or how, but some of these words are gonna affect some of you. So thank you so much for having me.